Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Janine Kurosawa, Community Engagement Specialist at Chaminade University. Welcome to session 401, The Future of Catholic Schools, presented by Dr. Helen Turner. If we could just take a few moments to go over some housekeeping rules before we begin. It might make it a little more pleasant if you reduce the panel view on your computer, as I believe we have well over 140 participants in this session. If you need a little quick reminder, it's the top right corner, you'll see a block of dots. You'll be able to select um, the speaker viewing platform. The session will be recorded and the chat saved. Should we run over and not have the time to answer your questions, we will add them to the discussion board on the main ACCE webpage under session 401. So please leave your questions in the chat. As I mentioned earlier, your presenter will be Dr. Helen Turner. Dr. Turner is Vice President for Strategy and Innovation and Professor of Biology at Chaminade University. As the Vice President of Strategy and Innovation, she leads Chaminade's innovation initiatives with a special emphasis on securing extramural funding, incubating new projects, and maintaining major community partnerships. She has been the primary architect of Chaminade's decade-long STEM transformation into a center of excellence for undergraduate science preparation, especially in fostering pipelines for students who have been historically disenfranchised from STEM or who have faced significant socioeconomic or cultural barriers to inclusion. She is a strong advocate for the transformative potential of Catholic education and the importance of Catholic educators in our community. Before we begin, however, I'd like to go ahead and put us in the presence of our, our Lord. If we could all take a few minutes and we will open in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of love and life, Thank you for the abundant blessings you have bestowed upon us all. Help us to look deep within ourselves and discover the gifts you have blessed us with and to receive your gifts with great joy. We thank you for our presenter today. May you guide her and inspire her to share her knowledge with us as we open our eyes, ears, and hearts to what we are about to learn and may it help us become better educators for our students. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us warmly welcome on this beautiful Friday morning, Dr. Helen Turner. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and um, I rarely say these words, but I wish you could all smell my office right now. So I, it is my birthday today, and people have been coming in all morning with these beautiful lay. And my office just smells wonderful because of that. So I wish you could have, I wish we had smell vision on this Zoom, but we don't. So we, we carry on anyway. So, so good morning. My name, as uh, Janine said, is Helen Turner. And the goal that I was given, the, the instructions from, from Mandy Thronus Brown, who's done a wonderful job of organizing this symposium, was to talk about the future of Catholic education. So no biggie, no pressure, right? This one, uh, this is a big topic. So what I'm going to talk about today is actually um, to sort of reflect and give some thoughts on where we stand as we contemplate the future of Catholic education, contextualized by everything that's been happening perhaps over decade long timeframes, but then also that is, uh, you know, seared into our consciousness by the rapid change that we've seen during the era of the COVID pandemic. And then, um, you know, spoiler alert, I don't think I have any answers, but I think I can uh, elaborate for us some of the challenges that we face uh, personally and professionally as we um, all play our part in the future of Catholic education. So I'm going to start with three slides that I uh, hope that the images sort of position some of the, the initial thinking that I'd been uh, doing uh, in preparing for this talk. So um, I wanted to start, you know, with this question, where are we standing right now as we contemplate the future of Catholic education? And uh, during the lockdown, I reread this, um, this searing 
Tale of Humanity by Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities, right? And it's one of those, book, those books that you come back to over different points in your life. Um, and of course, it starts with those iconic words, right? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. An age of wisdom, an age of foolishness, an age of belief, an age of incredulity, light, darkness, hope, and despair. And, um, you know, this book was written by Dickens about a time that also forged Father William Joseph Chaminade, who, for whom Chaminade is named, the founder of the Marianists. And, and it's a tale about understanding these dichotomies, that in times of great turmoil in our society, it's always going to be framed by what we've all been experiencing, which is this roller coaster. Um, and I'm certainly not minimizing, there's, there's no lens through which COVID has been the best of times, but I'm sure with all of us, there have been uh, elements of grace in it and elements of, of just feeling overwhelmed and despairing. And that really um, contextualizes, I think, where we are with Catholic education because COVID has sort of put a big bump in this roller coaster we've all been on for a number of years and we have to decide how we respond to it. The response in this book is a response, as I said, of searing humanism. And it is uh, a response of one human being to a change uh, in, in systems and societies that they can't possibly control. The second thing that I wanted, the second image that I just wanted to bring up um, to, to contextualize uh, this, this presentation um, is this is given to us by St. Bruno, the founder of the Carthusians. And I, I'm not even going to try to say the Latin because I haven't studied Latin since I was nine years old and the sisters gave up on me. But um, it says the cross stands as the world turns. And St. Bruno, obviously the founder of the Carthusians, and they are an example, aren't they, of, of constancy across millennia of the idea of these, these um, institutions of the church that people look to that do stand, right, against, the, the, against all of the change, all of the turmoil over very long periods of time. And, and those, you know, Carthusian um, religious, uh, there's something we can look to as an example of that constancy. And they have their own very special value to the church. And I think one of the themes that I want to look at today is how do we find a balance between constancy and change, between guarding the flame and reading the signs of the times and adapting to them? You know, and that signs of the times is a Vatican II type statement, right? But again, it comes to this idea of when seismic change is happening, do we stand firm? What do we choose to stand firm about? And what do we choose to say in this, in this thing we need to adapt and change? And so um, our Marianists at Chaminade that, that we work with every day, one of the Marianist values is that adaptation and change, right? And so, so I think I wanted to share this image as trying to understand um, as we go forward, what are we holding constant and what are we deciding that needs to change in Catholic education? And then the final of these three images that I wanted to start with is this one. This is a, a Carmelite uh, religious woman, uh, Mary of Jesus Crucified. And she said, you know, I just thread the needle. It's God who does the work. Right. And I feel that something we need to to decide, you know, personally, professionally, as we look at our roles in the future of Catholic education, is what are we going to try and control and what are we going to leave to Providence? Um, and I think that is, uh, given the pressures that we're all feeling, um, I think that is a really important conversation. Something else that she writes about, Mary of Jesus Crucified, is in her work, you know, which is a daunting uh work that she chose, which was to, to pray for the world every day, right? So again, no biggie, right? That's a pretty Herculanean task. And she speaks in her writings of alternately being kindled and doused. And that's her imagery to talk about this idea of on, you know, some morning she get up at four o'clock, because that's when I think Carmelites get out of bed. That's why I could never do it. Um, but she gets up and, and she's, she's kindled. She's ready to saddle up and go fight that fight and climb the mountain in the, in the sort of Carmelite imagery. And then some days she's just doused and she feels 
she doesn't have that fire. And of course, those highs and lows are exactly what we've all been feeling every minute of every day in during this whole COVID period is just riding that constant roller coaster. So I um, so I came to sort of these three questions. Um, they probably could be better phrased, but when I was thinking about our conversation about the future of Catholic education, is it the best of times or is it the worst of times? Do we stand or do we turn? You know, are we facing that, um, you know, the end of something or and are we facing something that can be reborn? And then personally and professionally and as individuals and as systems, are we kindled? Are we ready to get up? And, and saddle up and fight this fight to protect something that we hold dear? Or are we, are we just doused? You know, are our flames out because of everything we've been through in the last couple of years? So I'm gonna try and address these different questions. So is it the best of times? Is it the worst of times? When you look at, this is the 2020 to 2021 snapshot published by the National Catholic Education Association. And it provides a very uh, interesting perspective, I think, when you really kind of look at some of the numbers that surround Catholic education. Um, one narrative is Catholic education has declined by about 500,000 students since um, the 90s. The other way of looking at it, glass half full, is we have 1.6 million American students in Catholic schools. That is a very, very significant number. They're some of the most diverse schools that we have. They enroll 20% who are non-Catholics and 17 new Catholic schools opened, but 209 consolidated or closed. And I think this is the number that is just flipping everybody out, right? This is the thing. And I, I'm not saying it's not a serious number. I'm saying that there are other numbers that contextualize it. And if we uh, look at, I tried to do a survey of what people are writing about the, the trends for Catholic education. And so NCEA, again, February 2021, they put out a report. And, and what's nice about this particular set of numbers is that it contextualizes. It says, you know, back in the 60s, there were more than 5.2 million students in 13,000 Catholic schools across the nation. And I think when I read that, I think that was great. And I'm very proud to be part of, of that tradition. But those days are gone. And I think, you know, heydays can be dangerous, right? Because we keep looking back to them and thinking that we need to recover back to that kind of level. And that is, is not realistic. Some of the reasons that's not realistic are in our control and some are not. So one of the things it talks about here is that since 2010, large number of schools closed or con consolidated in other places, there are 260 schools that opened um, and the number of students declined. But, but this is, I think, is the most important uh, sentence in, in the whole report really, is that that's not unique to Catholic schools. Elementary school enrollment in the United States is declining uh, 25% year on year. So, so these are, this is this demographic cliff that we all start hearing about. So when you look at this, you think, okay, Catholic education is a system that is, um, in a sense, going through the worst of times, but we know that at the individual level and at the school level, there are immense bright spots, that the, the personal lived experience of our teachers and our students is as strong as it ever was, if not stronger than these days in the early 60s, when I think we could all agree that Catholic education might not have been everything that you would want it to be. So on... On the other side, then, we're starting to see reports like this. Um, Americans Catholic schools are seeing a surprising rise in enrollment. This is in The Economist. I didn't know The Economist had a section called Answered Prayers, but I'm going to be looking at that uh, more, more frequently, I think, going forward. And this is a quote. They said, you know, a woman um, from uh, the mainland, and she said, you know, I never envisaged sending my children to a public to a Catholic school. I've got a good public school. But during COVID, um, she heard good things about her St. Joseph, the worker school, and she sent her children there. And so we're seeing this, this bump in enrollment. One of the challenges is going to be, is that going to sustain? You know, I think 
there's a high, uh, a lot of statistics to support the idea that once a student comes to a Catholic school, they tend to stay. Our retention is typically very high. But we don't know that yet about the, the sort of COVID bump in, in enrollment. So, so what I hope this slide does is just kind of give us that idea of, you know, there are uh, demographic trends, there are things that are changing the landscape of Catholic education. There are also things that are happening um, at the system level that seem to be pushing back against those trends, at least in this, this small snapshot of time. But the quality of the product is, is that stands and that's not reflected in the statistics. So when I think about um, change and, and how we are thinking about responding to change in, in Catholic education, I feel like we're fighting a battle on multiple fronts, right? And so I just want to forgive me for how complex this slide looks, but wanted to try and evoke something for you. So um, I, I grew up near the near the sea in England. I've been fascinated by uh, waves and lighthouses and boats and things like that. And so one of my secret hobbies is I monitor um, wave information. I know. I, I just feel like I just said the geekiest thing ever. This this uh, this graph in the background, what it is, is is a measurement of wave heights in the English Channel, not far from where I live. And so these ones that you see just going from left to right, these are just the waves that happen every day that you can imagine the, the ships and the boats just kind of, you know, crossing these waves. And then every so often this happens. And this is a great example of these are deterministic changes that are just happening all the time. They're just part of the landscape. And every so often, some massive, stochastic, singular event happens. And that's what you see if you're staring out the front of your boat in the English Channel, right? This, this sort of wall coming towards you. And this is what COVID's been for us, right? In, in terms of what's just been part of the landscape of change that Catholic education is being asked to respond to, um, there's been stuff happening in the background for, for decades. The declining Catholic education, there is a demographic cliff. There, are, there is the changing nature of the family. The neighborhoods we typically serve are becoming gentrified, especially on the mainland. The enrollment curves for Catholic and charter schools crossed in 2012. The charter school movement actually um, demonopolized, I think, the Catholic monopoly on schools that were, were there, that were placing students first, that were meeting students in a very inclusive way. Um, and then, of course, safety, concerns for children, secularization, pluralistic society, disillusionment with the church. All of this has been happening. And then in the middle of it, this, this rogue event of COVID. So one of the things that I think is a real challenge for organizational change in Catholic education and elsewhere right now is, which of these are we responding to? If we put all our eggs in, in building response to this basket and it doesn't happen again for a hundred years, what are we, how have we really addressed these kinds of change? So um, I, I'm gonna give you a, a quote from a woman called Augusta Muthigani, and she was the president of the uh, International Catholic Education uh, Organization uh, a couple of years ago. So, so she, reading her work, she kind of uh, moved us out of worrying where we are in these peaks and troughs. And she gave a speech at a, uh, an, a, a conference called Educato C in 2019 at Fordham University. She just took a step back from it. And I want to share with you what she said. So she basically said that the future of Catholic education requires storytelling with data and, and communication to our stakeholders of what are these overarching principles that we um, that create this moral space in which we educate. And so one of the things she said is that in addition to all of those other deterministic changes that are eroding Catholic education, this, the central failing as she saw it was the lack of research data and documentation to prove our case and the lack of a sense that we are relevant to huge overarching goals for the planet, not just the individualized moral development of a given student. And so she said, you know, 
we should be contextualizing what we do with these huge overarching frameworks of a better world, like, for example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals she, she mentioned. And then she said this, she said, Catholic schools need to tell their story of provision of holistic quality education without apology. Catholic schools need to be clear on what they have achieved worldwide, the values they have inculcated in millions of citizens and their beneficial social, socioeconomic impact on societies. And what I felt, you know, when I read that was that was the, the single take home that I wanted to talk about in today was, was that we need to be better at telling the story um, in order to be a choice for parents that parents make. And that that is both a system level issue and it's a personal commitment as well. So I think what I took from, um, from Augusta's idea was that, yes, we need to be able to respond. We need to be capable of all types of change, crisis management, reacting to these rogue events, but also being very proactive, being thinking about change, you know, fundamentally, what are we going to firewall and not change? And what are we going to adapt? And being okay with the idea that some of these changes need to be seismic and reactive because we're facing this wave. And some of them need to be incremental responses to these deterministic changes that we've seen in our system over decades. And on top of all of that, if it wasn't enough, that we need to be better at personally and professionally telling the story of Catholic education and making the case. And you know, just to, to talk a little bit about the tensions, and I, I'm certainly not gonna go through all of these, these models, but one of the, the hardest things, I think if I had to say, what are the two hardest things about telling the story? I spend a lot of my time trying to tell the story about Catholic education and the Catholic worldview. And I think it comes down to two things. One is it is a challenge to the personal humility of the people who've chosen this kind of work. We are not marketers. We are not salespeople. We don't really know how to do it that well. And then philosophically, the things that we hold dear, the human person, the common good, universal access, our faith-based values are at least separate, if not antithetical to this understanding of quote, the market profit margins, individualism, competition, right? And we need to get over that at some level, um, but not to the point where we stop being who we are. Um, there are some wonderful literature. I have no intention of going through this horribly complex diagram, but there is some wonderful literature about there, uh, about being able to work in both of those spaces. And um, I put a link here that we could all go back to later that links to all of the literature that's quoted here. Um, wonderful scholarship on market identity and Catholic identity, how you reconcile those ideologies, how you have discourse around those things. So the first challenge that I just wanted to uh, talk about today for all of us um, is how do we make the case for Catholic education as individuals and as systems? And I don't have an answer to that. As I said, I don't have any answers, but I wanted to just talk about three things that I thought about. So I, uh, a few years ago, I worked with Hawaii Catholic schools and we looked at all of the, um, the marketing materials from, the different, from a number of different schools and they all came to consensus. They were very different visually, but they all basically said, here's the things that we do and here's the things that we do them well. And and they kind of end up looking like this, right? Safe, welcoming environment, partnering with parents, faith formation, technology, service to others, respect, moral development. And I just want to put forward the idea that for some of the challenges we're facing, it might be important for us right now to recognize that we don't have a monopoly on this anymore. Um, charter schools are also in this space. What we really need to talk about is that, yes, we are caring and we are excellent, but what are our differentiators from if, if a parent is looking at a choice, what is the secret source of a Catholic education? And I, again, don't have the time to answer that question, but I think this book is, is really interesting to me, Lost Classroom, Lost Community. It's an examination of what happens when you close Catholic schools and the impacts on the communities. And that somewhere in that is the secret source that we are 
uh, special to our students, but there's also something bigger in, in what we do for the communities that's in the families that surround them. And then I think we need to be um, very avail uh, very able, all of us, personally, professionally, at the system level, to talk about the return on investment of a Catholic education. And of course, this is where, you know, there's a market term, right? Return on investment, but it's a market term that just is a distillation of everything that is special about Catholic education, the affordability, the transformative social mobility that comes from this kind of education, and then the excellence in academics. On my Facebook feed, there popped up this book the other day, God Grades in Education. And it's written by this woman. She's a Jewish scholar from the East Coast. And it's got this, this, this sort of tone of surprise through the whole thing saying, wow, kids in religious schools get really good grades and they outperform their peers. And, you know, we already knew that. But, but there are um, statistics out there that let us uh, say that in an ironclad way. And I think we all have a responsibility to kind of arm ourselves with those, those statistics. Interestingly, one of the themes that I don't have time to go into today in this book is she talks about the idea of undermatching, that we produce remarkable students, especially women, we collectively Catholic education, and they choose, she says, mystified. She's, she's mystified by the fact they don't choose to go to often these really elite higher education institutions. She's like, yeah, they choose like small schools, faith-based schools. And again, I'm, I'm reading the whole thing and I'm just like, yeah, duh, you know, we, we know this and we know why they make those choices. But I think this is an important um, set of ideas. We, we don't have a monopoly. It may not be enough to just talk about caring and excellence. We have secret source that we don't really um, necessarily always put forward. And we have statistics to back up what a remarkable gift to Catholic education is. Um, and just as another idea, many, many of these infographics exist out there. I only throw one up here because this is a, a these are great um, tools. And, and I think they're out there on plenty of websites. But my question is, are they on your phone? And are you ready to show them to someone who says, hey, you work in a Catholic school. What do you think about this? I think arming ourselves with all these resources that are already out there that make the case I think that's that's an important part of our professional practice going forwards. So next question, do we stand or do we turn? What is a Catholic education? Are we guarding a flame or are we reading the signs of the times? I do not have the answer to this question either. I know that in our Catholic world, in our iconography, there are lots of pictures like this. White men in you know, complex outfits telling us about guarding the flame, right? And yet what we're being asked to do is, is something more nuanced than that, is to read the sides of the times and decide what do we hold dear, what are we not willing to change, and what do we have to change if we are going to maybe not reverse. We're never going to reverse the trend of, you know, get back to five and a half million students in Catholic schools. But how do we, we, we need to stop the bleeding and we need to, to respond to the, the Catholics we have today, right? And again, I don't have a lot of answers. I think that there is a balance between tradition and the, for the sake of it and having fidelity to something bigger than just the traditions. I think that we need to talk about change, not for the sake of change, not in a, in a crisis way, but really to innovate our way um, into this, this new future. And, and we think that we have to do all this really fast and really we just need to be responsive. And I know those sound like semantic things, but um, there are, I think, real questions in, in you know, that, that balance between being you know, proactive and being reactive. And, and we need to think about that. We need to acknowledge who our American Catholics are. 52% um, of them um, say that they, they leave the church, you know, either for some a while or permanently. 46% of them believe that marriage of gay and lesbian people should be recognized. 62% of them believe that working for the poor is fundamental to being a Catholic, right? And so, so understanding who our audience is and what their decision-making paradigm is, I mean, it's again, it's both a personal thing, it's a professional thing, and it's a system level thing. 
I, I think when I first started, when I got the job of being vice president for innovation at Chaminade, looking at the innovation literature to kind of educate myself, I saw a lot of curves and these things called the innovation curve. And they're these diagrams and they basically say, okay, you have an idea, you have a visionary who kind of promotes it. And then it talks about how ideas propagate through institutions and how change gets made. And these curves, if you have a look at that literature, it's full of, they, they, they label um, people who are kind of like late adopters or laggards or traditionalists, like it's a bad thing, right? And I think that one of the challenges we have as we kind of innovate our way out of these, uh, this current kind of crisis is to really think about um, valuing our traditionalists, but not guarding a flame without any critical thinking applied to that. So challenge number two for all of us, evaluating these alternate futures. And this is where, when I was prepping this talk, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's just too much to talk about. But I wanted to put together um, just some, some ideas that are out there that are ways other school districts and other um, locations are talking about their response um, and what they see the future. And in no particular order, these are just meant to be things that you might say to yourself, I'm gonna look that up later. So, so there is narrative out there about this idea of right sizing to the community's demands, that if there aren't 5 million students, we have to have enough schools to serve 2 million students. And that that is a, a, you know, a right sizing kind of challenge, but of course it comes with immense uh, human, societal and community um, costs associated with it. There's an emergence of Catholic school networks, these kind of hub and spoke operations where administrative and, and fiscal functions are kind of uh, located in one central location and that decreases costs so that other, so you're not duplicating those services at many different schools. Some uh, Catholic school systems are even having teachers operate in a hub and spoke way where a teacher is centralized and then goes out and teaches at different schools, different model. Um, the Alliance for Catholic Education is like a Catholic Teach for America, overcoming some of the, the basic budget model issues that we no longer have religious who teach classes for free in the numbers they we used to have. So how can we mitigate those personnel gaps? A huge emphasis on philanthropy, going back to Catholics who benefited from this type of education, asking them to help us save it very important uh, part of what we're trying to do. Again, it requires that we make the case. Um, Catholic to charter conversion. Uh, if you look up um, some of what happened in uh, Florida in the Jubilee schools setting, you, that will be a great ride through something that looked really, really good and then kind of went, went to hell really badly afterwards. But nevertheless, there are success stories associated with Catholic to charter conversion, and there are uh, tales of woe associated with that. Some schools think talk a lot about moving to higher paying customers um, and doing that in a way to compete with elite private schools that are in their um, environment, doing that without losing the identity and the, and the preferential option for the poor. Is that problematic? The Christo Ray model, being part of the vote, the debate nationally about school choice, vouchers, tax credits, federal funding, public scholarships, um, doing what we do, but just telling the story better is some district's response to, to their, their declining enrollment. And then, you know, technology, blended learning, of course. And so, so I think um, I don't have a take on which of these things is, is good, bad, the other, I have some opinions, but I think the issue is knowing what's out there and understanding that there are beginning to be some toolkits to understand what worked and what didn't work in different locations. You know, particularly if you look at the literature around the Catholic to charter conversions, but these are really complex issues we need to engage with as individuals um, and as professionals and that our system needs to engage with as well. So are we kindled or are we doused? The kind of the last question, right? So, so I keep coming back to this idea. What is the future of Catholic education? Is it of the person? Is it of the system? And I, I think it's really both. Many of the questions today are above all of our pay grades, right? But they nevertheless fall on our shoulders. 
it, and I think it requires, you know, the types of grassroots efforts that are the sort of really inspirational legacy of being part of not just Catholic education, but Catholic social justice, Catholic nursing. Catholic, this is Mother Angelica who founded her TV station in, in the garage of her con convent when, when some uh, TV executive told her she couldn't do that. You know, there's an, a legacy of defiance and the idea that small groups of, of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And so while I think there are big, big questions for us individually as Catholic educators and, and, and persons of this faith, I think it's also to do with what we decide to do as small groups, grassroots, committed uh, individuals who, who want to change the narrative. And that comes to that part of, uh, I really didn't want to end this, this talk by saying everyone's got to be a salesperson, but there is an element of that, that if we just do things at the system way and we don't do things in the grassroots relationship based person to person way that we're I think all used to doing business then we won't we won't change in the way that we want to change it'll end up being top down and and we'll lose as much as we gain so I I think I'm always looking back to the history of these remarkable especially women in the Catholic Church who really just said okay I'm going to get out there and I'm going to start changing this as a person and as an individual and then the system can get in line and kind of follow my lead. Um, I'm inspired by those women. So what does that mean? So my third challenge then is that the question at the beginning of all this is what is the future of Catholic education? The future is you, it's me and you, it's us making the case. That means being engaged in grassroots personal advocacy to our families, our communities, whatever networks we have, anybody that we can tell this story to. It means having the facts at your fingertips to back it up, you know, not just the stories of what your individual students did, but what the, as Augusta told us, the remarkable outcomes of a Catholic education. Um, then at the kind of more system level, we all have to be involved in, in evolving the product, deciding where it needs to go. What do we keep? What do we change? And I think also we need to be a little bit wary of, as I always am, after 20 years in Hawaii, of looking to the mainland or looking to other models and thinking that they'll work here. We need to think local and we need to evolve Catholic education locally first, based on the wisdom of, of all of your experiences. So um, I'm gonna finish then with just one more quote from uh, Sidney Carton, who's the hero of that book, A Tale of Two Cities. And before he does, I'm not, in case any of you haven't read it, I'm actually not gonna do the spoiler alert. But before he does the thing that he does at the end of it all, he talks about this idea of, of, of being kindled into a sudden mastery, right? And, and that's where we are. You know, we, we have all um, been through so much these last couple of years. I don't entirely feel like a heap of ashes, but I have colleagues who do, who are just so tired and, and it's hard to saddle up for this next battle. But for Sydney, something kindled him. And I think we can all look to um, the grace that we work with to, to kindle us and, and just um, get us ready for this, this next phase of, of what, what the future is for, for something we all hold so dear, which is Catholic education. Two popes, guy on the left, Benedict, love him. He said, over and above this, a Catholic school should help all its students to become saints. So no pressure to all of you, <laughs> talk about a big ask. Francis said, a Catholic education is love. And if, there's, if there was ever a statement of what is the secret source of a Catholic education, I think that is the opportunity to, to take a step on that path to, to sainthood and to do it surrounded by love. Um, yeah, we should be telling that story. So I'll stop there, I'll take questions and thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking in the, I'm actually looking in the chat. So Lisa asked, um, will you be sharing the slide deck? Yeah, I can share the slide deck if you like it. I'm very happy. Thank you for all the birthday wishes. Um, does anyone have a, a question or a comment um, 
on anything. Mary, it's a long time since I saw you and you're right in the middle of my screen right now. So is there anything that you, you wanted to comment or, or that this was helpful in any way or not helpful? And then I think Llewellyn had a comment as well. He said, uh, it's like an apologetics list for Hawaii Catholic education. Llewellyn, would you like to, if you're still on, would you like to expand on that a little bit? I'm wondering if, Mary, did you try to unmute and it kind of didn't work? Okay, all right, good. Uh, and Ellen in the chat says, um, she doesn't mind being a saleswoman for our school. And I think, good, right? So now the question is, how do we kind of arm ourselves and, and be ready for that? Um, Kepa, did you have any comments? I saw you kind of moving around. I feel like I'm trapped in like, you know, when, when a Zoom class goes, uh, d becomes difficult. <laughs> Oh, okay. So Janine says, sorry, we've been instructed to keep you all muted. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right. So, um, so maybe then, uh, Mary, do you think you could, so, so Bernard says, can the Catholic school model be used as a Catholic model? Um, whew. so, uh, I, I'm going to answer that by saying, I, I think so. I think that the challenges that we face, you know, in Catholic education are also the inherent challenges of uh, that the church faces, right, in general about, um, you know, understanding where we fit today. And so one of the things that we have um, next, uh, in the next couple of weeks at Chaminade is we have um, someone coming, uh, Bishop McElroy from the West Coast, and he's talking about synodality. And I don't know if we can, maybe Janine, we could put a link to that in the chat, but it's part of our Marianist lecture theater, uh, series. And he's coming to talk about the fact that in 2023, the general synod is going to be asking all of us, right? Asking us for our input and what is the future of the church? What is the future um, of our uh, education systems, our healthcare systems and so on? So, when I, I sort of think that's that's part of engaging, but um, in a cat in so Bernard also asks, is this is this a public model? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think that there is a lot of um, the public the public spaces. The thing is, they get to be complacent, right? Because they they get to say, we're going to have enrollment no matter what. And certainly for us in higher education, I, I alternate between being deeply envious of that situation and then also deeply aware of the fact that it, it doesn't then lend itself to evolving the product really well. And so I definitely feel that in, um, in the public education space, I think there's a lot of catching up to do with the very best aspects of Catholic education. Um, probably not everybody would agree with that, but I, I do feel that we have, it would be great to have some dialogue and some partnership with our public colleagues, but whether they could really just, I'm just thinking of the on-ramp to them adopting some of these, these ways of, of doing business, it, at least what I can see in the difference between Catholic higher education and public higher education is that's a really, really big challenge. Um, Llewellyn just sort of uh, put something in the chat. He says, this is the challenge we face today. How do we capture our story and do it in such a way we can draw people to us? Um, you know, Llewellyn, I mean, you know, right, I struggle all the time with, with trying to tell the story of, of what we're doing here at Chaminade. And I think at some point, and this is not meant to in any way be disrespectful to our marketing people, but at some point I just stopped waiting for the marketing people to do it for me. And I just started going out and telling people and trying to have, um, you know, community ambassadors, community engagement specialists in the university whose role it is to just get out there and tell the story. And those stories do need to be 
system level and highly factual and quantitative, but they also need to be the story of every single experience, every student, every grace that we see every day, right? So I guess there is that arming with a powerful story, but it's who develops that story and who is the champion. And I, I worry about, you know, one of the responses to all of, of this, Llewellyn, you know, in the leadership positions is always, you know, well, can we get a consultant? Can someone help us do better brochures and all those kind of things? And I think that's got its place, but it's not all of it. And if we just abdicate to that and expect, quote, marketing to do this for us, we're really missing an opportunity to do the grassroots thing. So Malcolm asked the question, hi, Malcolm, what is the best way to create more buy-in from faculty, staff, and families, especially when they don't initially agree with the strategy or direction you want to move Catholic schools? Um, uh, I, I think that, um, so obviously there needs to be a foundation of trust and transparency and a lot of, almost to the point of cliche, right? Those, those kinds of things. Something that I have found useful is to really engage people in a road mapping exercise. So an instrument that I use a lot in my um, practice is something called a theory of change. It's really just a logic model. But what's nice about that particular model is um, often with a group, you know, community group, a faculty group, whoever it is that I'm working with, first thing we'll do is get in a room with some really big post-it notes uh, on the wall and kind of develop um, that that sort of logic model, theory of change model. What what is driving us to be in this place? What are the assumptions we're making? What are the ideas we have, right? And then how are we going to kind of lay that out? And what do we expect the impact to be at the end of the day? And if you um, working through that kind of process with um, grassroots stakeholders usually those kind of processes are limited to strategic planning exercises among leadership, things like that. I have found that doing that with community and with stakeholders is actually really, really valuable. And if you want, um, if you think that might be of interest to you, we can, we can follow up later and I can just show, sort of show you what that looks like. And if it was of any interest to you, I'd be happy to, to help you with that. But that's just one concrete suggestion, which is, um, taking that whole kind of, you know, strategic planning thing and, and the way that it's usually just siloed for sort of leadership to do and actually taking that and replicating it for the grassroots stakeholders. Um, we have done that. It has been successful and uh, I, I a very, actually a really kind of enlightening process actually. So Ellen says, and you are absolutely right, Ellen, and I should have said this, she teaches her students to advocate for their education every day because they are our greatest salespersons. Uh, yeah, yeah. Next year you should give this talk, but I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, um, you know, some of the students that I know from, from the Catholic school system, yeah, you're just these exceptional young people, right? And they are, you're truly the best advocate and the best story that we could tell. Janine, how are we doing for time? I wasn't sure. We're good. You have about a good eight, nine minutes left to go. Okay. I mean, as a British person, I'm comfortable with awkward silences, but I think it would be better if, if someone could ask a couple questions. Um, uh, let me ask you, I mean, and I'm sorry about the chat thing and the, the muting and everything, but is there, um, you know, is there anything that any of you have seen um, in your own schools that, that kind of connects with that idea of the grassroots advocacy, or if, if you were going to go out and start doing that tomorrow, what is it you don't have? Like, what do you not feel armed with to do that? Um, before we get to that then, so while you are guys are all typing, Mary, I do not see your fingers typing right now. So, um, so someone asked, are you a Catholic school alum? Yes. So I um, went to a variety of different schools. My dad was in the army and I kind of bounced around a lot. Um, I saw um, British public education. So in the sense of like the state schools, I saw the inside of a couple of those in my time. I also um, got scholarships to go to some 
secular, a couple of very elite schools in England where I didn't do very well. I was kind of not the easiest student to have in a school, I think. Um, and so, so I, some of my tenure at some of those schools was quite short, uh, in, in one term, in one case, don't want to get into it. Uh, not the proudest point of my life. But then uh, I went to two um, Catholic schools, a Sacred Heart School and an Ursuline School in England. And um, yeah, life changing. At the public school, the state comprehensive school, I was told that I couldn't study engineer, uh, electrical engineering because that was a boys class. And I went to a Catholic school and the nuns were like, yeah, we don't know how to do that, but you go ahead, figure it out. Right. Um, and there were, you know, just so many experiences like that. So, so for me, um, definitely the, the Catholic education I had was, was an education about justice, right? But it also was intellectually the most, having been literally at every type of school you could, you could talk about in, in the UK, and it was in the Catholic spaces that I found true intellectual freedom. And I don't think that's most people, especially in England, that's not most people's view of Catholic education. As, as something of freedom and joy, as opposed to something of constraint and discipline. And um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, I, I am a, a Catholic school alum, yeah. So Gloria asked, uh, is there a direct relationship between the Catholic identity of school and its enrollment? So uh, I would say, yes, you know, I, I think because what drives enrollment is is a sense of um specialness right what is special about a place why would i choose this against another right so you know public schools i think are thinking about yeah they have a defined catchment area they're going to get x number of students no matter what for us who are in a more you know competitive or kind of market driven space i think the reason strong identities and the ability to to say as Augusta said, in no uncertain terms, make the case without apology for who we are, that has to be a positive driver of enrollment. I think that one of the, the things that, you know, it's TBD, what, what we're going to see now is that COVID broke the relationship between Catholic identity and enrollment, uh, because in, you know, like that example I gave, we just became a better choice than a public school that hadn't, that had 83% uh, 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 sorry, that had gone down by 83% in terms of enrollment um, and was hemorrhaging students and was it completely online and was in chaos, right? So we don't yet know whether that will be a sustainable um, decoupling of Catholic, Catholic identity and the choice of a Catholic school for your child. We don't know yet whether that will sustain. Um, Vertigo says, are you aware of any studies that examine the connection between the decline in church attendance membership and declining enrollment schools? Yes. And I, I can I can share some of those on the discussion board. A lot of them are kind of mid 90s. They've they, they got this kind of sense of, you know, the church is is everything's, you know, the church is declining. And so there's less Catholics choosing schools. I'm not sure how relevant they are to this situation we find ourselves in right now. But one of those deterministic changes, obviously, is the fact that there simply are less people who um, who evince a Catholic faith and less people who act on it by sending their kids to Catholic school, right? So there's there's both the demographics, the statistics, and there's also do you, do you convert that to action? That being said, um, you know I teach biology and in ecology we have the concept of a niche, right? And there's this concept of, you know, ecologically, there's no reason we can't own certain niches, right? So if we are looking at a small neighborhood where there's a great Catholic school and we're a great choice, then we should be able to uh, punch above our weight in that, that small context and really win, yeah, yeah, win constituents. And, and so, um, it's like the, there's a there's a shrimp in Hawaii. I can't remember its name right now. And this is all shrimp and it lives in lava tubes. And it's the king of that lava tube. It's the only shrimp that lives in the lava tube. There's no real predators for it there. 
And so it really gets to own that space. And it's this tiny little shrimp that probably wouldn't do well elsewhere, but it does really well in that niche that it has managed to carve out. So I do think we need to move away from thinking how are we going to win big statistical battles and think about winning local battles that we can all play a part in influencing, right? So Janine says we got five minutes uh, and... Uh, yeah, anything else? Uh, oh, Llewellyn says the smaller K through eight schools frequently concern they can't carve out a substantial marketing budget, but grassroots campaigns don't have to cost a lot. I think you're absolutely right, Llewellyn. And I think also maybe that's an element of the hub and spoke model that could be. So the hub and spoke model for, that a lot of Catholic school systems have adopted is centralizing administrative functions to avoid duplication and, and gain efficiencies in cost. There's a part of me that wonders, though, whether that is something that could be hubbed. I mean, it has to be spoke, right, because only those school educators can tell the story of their school. But there could be some um, hubbing to it as well, where there could be some efficiencies. But you're absolutely right. Grassroots doesn't have to cost a lot, but it does have to be organized. It can't be totally you know, chaotic and just you know, hope that you might meet somebody in an elevator. I think you know, grassroots campaigns where we all decide we're going to go to our local Rotary Club or our neighborhood board meetings or whatever it is, right? There just needs to be, it's not a completely unstructured approach is kind of my, my point. Yeah. So Kyle says, um, we appreciate the presentation of alternative futures. We don't usually consider those until the dark hours. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Kyle. I, I don't, I think, like I said, this is this is dark time, but um, you know, it's not completely the darkest time, right? And so we do have an opportunity to to kind of think about how we want to to evolve in in the future. Where's the best place to get statistics on the benefits of Catholic schools? Um, so I, I just. Before I was prepping this, I Google. So National uh, Catholic Education Association, NCEA, they have downloadable infographics. Then at the next level, you're going to start to see um, individual dioceses like Washington did a really good job. A couple of others that, you know, again, I just got to them through Googling that made sort of their own infographics. I believe that Llewellyn has, um, you know, lots of statistics on Hawaii Catholic education. I think possibly a gap that we might need to address is in, you know, as Llewellyn just said, you know, how do we have a, a set of, of materials or that, that sort of arm us in Hawaii, talking to people in Hawaii or in our neighborhood? That I, I don't know if that's a gap, but it might be. Yeah. So, so Janine says that, that we need to close. Um, and uh, I was super nervous about this presentation and um, partly because of the whole Zoom thing. Um, but I really um, it was good to connect with you all to see the faces that I miss you all um, and to see the, the names coming up in the chat. And um, so even though we had to connect like this, it, it's been wonderful to connect with you. Thank you so much.